All right. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be uh, around the globe. We had quite a turnout of uh, registrations. Um, I know we still have a few more people that are going to be hopping on, but I'm uh, a stickler on trying to make sure that we start on time. Uh, if you have any problems with your audio, oh, I did do a check. I know that it's going to be something on your end. Uh, you know, I, I have removed uh, the access into go to training uh, that's across uh, the HCP front end. So you have to have the go to meeting client to be able to get things to work correctly. Uh, we had too many issues with that. Excited that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the new training kit, uh, we've been really hard at work and trying to get everything to to be a bit more seamless, as well as have a lot of really cool features. Uh, everything I'm going to be discussing today, uh, you know, we'll be talking about uh, some of the software release, you know, that I'll be posting later today. Uh, tried to do that last night prior to the webinar and ran into a, a storage issue on the Google Drive, but uh, we got that fixed and it's being uploaded now. It just won't be available until a little later this afternoon. Uh, the other part is that we're planning, I'll be discussing uh, the uh, uh, a new I.O. board, the new physical board uh, that we have for the training kits, and that will be released next month uh, to go along with our training uh, that I'll be discussing. So I know a lot of you are new uh, to our training platform. Uh, even with that, I mean, the platform has been around now for about five years. Uh, we released it initially through a Kickstarter about a year and a half ago as we made it be uh, not the industrial edition, but the mini kit, something that was, was much more palatable from a cost standpoint. So, but I'm still going to go ahead and go through a little bit of a history of Saibati Works and the program and the effort and catalyst behind developing uh, the software and the, and the training environment. Uh, from that, I'm going to demonstrate some of the new features. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, I'm really excited about what we've been able to accomplish in here. I think it'll be really helpful. Uh, number one, uh, for developing new products uh, to be able to help cyber secure our infrastructure. Uh, again, I primarily focus on critical infrastructure and, and cyber physical or control systems. Uh, but the reality is critical infrastructure, whether it's for a nation or an individual or any company, uh, is something you want to go and make sure it's being protected. And the Internet of Things is a, is a strong player in that where, uh, you know, even your households uh, are growing in attack surface. So the catalyst, as I was going to say behind this, is to, number one, be able to make it easier to develop new products. Number two, be able to overcome the hurdles that you may have in trying to demonstrate and articulate risks within cyber physical systems. You know, truly have some kind of a quick demonstration you can do of, uh, of an attack surface. Uh, but then ultimately, you know, as we get out of that, I mean, this isn't a red team pin testing platform and just talking about ICS, SCADE, IoT hacking. Uh, the ultimate effort is to be able to provide better solutions for the defense. Uh, and, and the challenge has been on the defensive posture is a lot of people will say, hey, we just want to reject the risk. And I'm trying to help. We're trying to help with, with removing that risk rejection. Let's overcome that hurdle. The first step you have to do is admit you have a problem. And then from there, you can start going and fixing it. So through that, that's where some of these new features have been developed. Uh, I've become very specific on some of the community involvement. I know in the past I've had a lot of bullets and things that were all over the place. So we have a couple of very specific bullets that uh, maybe you can help it and be involved in what we're trying to develop. And then uh, announcing the new online, online course access. Um, the kits, you know, they have gone through a variety of iterations and different types of models and transportation hurdles and, and what works and doesn't work. You know, uh, we, we have the, the training environment at a couple different universities. You know, I'm excited to see, again, uh, Villanova represented George Mason, Whatcom Community College. Uh, we have two other universities signing up. I can't say anything yet there. Uh, the SANS ICS 515 course uh, uses our mini kits. Of course, we use them. Uh, and I'm getting more and more requests really on, I'm really almost now a, a daily basis of, of trying to have ways to incorporate these into training environments. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, the, the hurdles have been, how do you transport this thing, right? How do you make it easy to get around? And we've had some different designs that, that failed horribly. You know, there was one here on the screen right now of our uh, iPhone assembly line that we built out as a kinetic model. Beautiful model, a lot of effort went into it. <clears throat> I mean, Hundreds of hours of effort went into designing it, and then as you ship this around, ship this thing around, the TSA decides to do drop tests on it. As you're going through the airport, you realize that it wasn't the best model uh, to be able to support 
uh, the training. You're trying to fix it all the time. Uh, moving into some of these other models, like we moved into our Kickstarter using Snap Circuits. Again, love it. Love Snap Circuits. Always going to make sure that our platforms are exp expandable into uh, those platforms or, or those solutions. But the reality was, I mean, we had some people in training that literally, as they were using a screwdriver, slipped and, and stabbed themselves. <clears throat> and, and that's just not something that I want to be dealing with. You know, and they took about 75 minutes to put together, so they just didn't necessarily work out. Now, some of the other big goals I'm showing this is to have, again, an expandable environment, something that you can build your own kinetic models, build your own really Cybody Works solution, right? When, you know, whether you want to have a, uh, a rail system, whether you want to have an assembly line, whether you want to have, you know, I, I had in the posting a, a wireless crane, whatever you want to use as your kinetic physical model uh, that it's easy to extend into some of these other platforms. So, you know, that's the hope out of that. Um, We've had so many people that have been involved in this really over the past you know, five years. Uh, you know, this training kit went around the globe, uh, the industrial edition anyway. Uh, there's now been you know, oh, well over you know, a couple thousand participants in a variety of aspects. Uh, we're at about a thousand that have gone through the five day training. And then as you get into you know, all the other touch points of, of half day, day long educational events, we're up over a couple thousand participants. Uh, but there's been some mainstays out of that that have provided some really good feedback. And I want to, again, continue to promote them. Uh, the training environment. Absolutely, we use it professionally in our courseware where we're dealing with big control system asset owner and operators. Uh, but then, of course, we're also tying into academic institutions, whether it's the universities that I discussed earlier or earlier this year. Um, we had our first high school that we uh, were able to do some training at. So that was pretty excited to include that uh, as an element. <clears throat> you know, the reality is we need a supply chain of, of, of smart people that understand some of even what cyber physical even is, right? I mean, you, know, you you number one have to overcome the hurdle earlier on, hey, milk just doesn't come from the store, right? There's actually literally a control system behind that whole thing of how milk is number one, even pumped to them being cartonized and, and shipped to you. I mean, there's a large process that goes along with that uh, that really can't just be utility focused. It has to be more, hey, let's go and look at what's there so we can understand how we need to protect it. And, and the change really has been, you know, 2008 is when cyber became the fifth military domain in the U.S., at least publicly discussed, and other nations have followed suit. So that's a huge shift, uh, really, in, in how you have to address cybersecurity. You know, I've always called that the Gatling gun moment, really, from the mid-1800s, as people try to have the discussion of what's changed. Well, hey, you have to change our armor we have to change how we protect ourselves, or actually armor, not armament, our armor, and how we defend ourselves and have some additional real-time analysis of what's going on. And again, that's what we're trying to do. There's a bullet on there talking about 85 rate of identified uh, new vulnerabilities during the course week. Yeah, I mean, we, we bring in real equipment, real hardware. <clears throat> um, one of the things that the mini kit has been based off of uh, is in our lab here, uh, literally that I'm sitting in right now, we have a little bit over, uh, I was adding it up, about $1.3 million worth of equipment, software licenses, uh, and, and, you know, that, that go along with that and five years of effort, uh, you know, to say the least, in, in trying to develop what we have. Now, we've been successful in importing a lot of that over to this mini kit, and which is pretty crazy, right? I mean, I, I look at it and saying, wow, I, I wish I could have not necessarily spend all that money and building out the lab, knowing that we can now have a miniature kit that can accomplish a lot of the same feats uh, of that million dollar lab. And that's, that's exactly what we have. You know, you're going to be able to have with you uh, this environment that provides quite a bit of, of capability and flexibility. We're still keeping our industrial edition kits. You know, we're always going to have those. We're trying to make them be easier to build. Uh, as we build them now, you know, they take about 20 hours per kit to be able to build everything out. Uh, we were excited that uh, Archer Energy Solutions uh, actually gave one away at B-Sides Jackson uh, just a, a month ago. It was a student, uh, as exciting as that is, that uh, was able to say why uh, and how they were going to use the kit. And, you know, Archer gave it away and we sell those. I mean, that's a $10,000 training kit that they gave away at B-Sides Jackson. So how exciting for them. But we are trying to, to make that be easier and more attainable to gain access to. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about our new I.O. boards that we're still building. They're not complete yet. But the hope is to have our training kits. Uh, and it's not just hope. We, we've, we've successfully tested it. So I know it's going to work. 
uh, but it's to expand into a printed circuit board that will be a quick connect into uh, the Siemens S7-1200 controller, as well as the uh, uh, Rockwell 850 series of controllers. Uh, don't like it. I'd like to be able to stay in the MicroLogics line, but I, I, I can't uh, for the quick connect needs that we want to be able to have something really easy to be able to spade into. But that's something exciting that we're going to be able to have our mini kits be expandable into really that industrial edition uh, at some point next year. Uh, as I had mentioned, you know, the, the training environment began through a Kickstarter where we had the first edition of the Raspberry Pi, the Pi Face Digital sitting on top. Snap circuits, DIN rail, everything else to be able to connect it up. Uh, a lot of the magic was to, you know, how in the world can we make this easier to power things? As we bring our training environment around the globe, we have to deal with a variety of not only uh, voltages and currents, but also uh, dealing with a variety of adapter plugs. So, you know, the world already has laptops that have adapter plugs and transformers and everything to go with it. So we wanted to have something that we could power entirely off USB. And, and we were successful in doing that. And there was a lot of magic and, 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 and pain. It wasn't just a selection, hey, Raspberry Pi happened to be the answer and we know this is going to be, and just luck. We tried Netduino. We tried Arduino. We tried BeagleBone. We tried all these other different types of hardware platforms, as well as trying to figure out the community and the direction, right? What's the strategy behind where are they going to go in the future? And so the Raspberry Pi is what we stayed with and, and very, uh, it's worked quite well. We have transitioned over time. We no longer require the Pi face. We're building in our own I.O. board to be able to support it and we now have quick connects. The other big magic uh, that we started incorporating uh, earlier this year uh, is NRL Core software. Pretty excited about what we can do with that. Uh, it's software-defined networking, open source basically. The Naval Research Laboratory and, and efforts with Boeing and several other players uh, developed and uses Linux network namespaces to allow us to do software-defined networking. Basically taking our virtual machine and allowing it to turn into 100 to 200 to even 1,000 nodes on a very small amount of processing and, and RAM. Uh, and you can scale up quite amazingly. So the the really cool part about this is that we can now, and this is something I've wanted with my you know my Cisco and CCIE background for for a decade. And in fact, that's really how I got started with the SAN Institute <clears throat> twelve years ago. I sat down over lunch with Stephen Northcutt. And we're like, hey, you know what? We need to have some Cisco training, you know, networking training within the science curricula. And uh, and we tried it, you know, and, and we tried it for about you know a year. And it just it, it really it failed horribly. It failed horribly because we had to tie back into across the Internet to a, a data center that we had a bunch of Cisco routers and everything to go with it. Or we tried to ship things around and it just didn't it just didn't work out. I mean, the, the training was great. It's just that all of a sudden then you, we'd have network drops. The hotel network would just have a problem. So what's really cool is now we can have <laughs> network style training and protocol analysis and everything else all inside one single platform. Right. If I want to demonstrate an EtherCAT man in the middle attack, it generally required three virtual machines to accomplish that. Now, now I can do that all on one virtual machine using software-defined network and Linux namespaces. So pretty amazing piece of software. It basically is Visio with a play button uh, as you get into it, but a lot more. And, and we'll show that as we get into the demonstrations. So the next part is educational outcomes. Again, the the goal behind this platform, again, the longer term vision, you know, as myself being a, a consultant and instructor you know, for some time, is I want to make it easier for security researchers to be able to have a platform to base things on. I want to make it easier for cyber defenders to be able to have a platform that you can then show actual attacks that you don't have to. Uh, so it's not as difficult to overcome the hurdles of, oh, that risk doesn't exist. No, nobody could ever do that. That's not realistic. You know, I want that. And then I want the next one to be, I want you to be able to prove that your security tools are actually working correctly, right? I want you to be able to make it easy to work that lab environment. You know, our lab here, yeah, great. We have over a million dollars worth of equipment. But guess what? It's hard. It's hard to maintain 10 systems, 15 systems, all these different devices when I just want to go and test a couple of different scenarios. Now, all of a sudden, it becomes a lot easier with how we tie all of the underlying ICS, IoT type of elements that are built into the CyBodyWorks platform with the core software, with everything else we've tied into. It. It's making it that much easier to be able to build, break, and then show defensive postures that you can have within your IT and ICS and IoT environments. So, again, to go back, you know, another point out of the participants. 
right? I'm a father. I'm a father of five children. You know, I, I struggle really on a daily basis, not a daily basis, but on, a, on an ongoing basis with just trying to articulate to my kids, you know, what does daddy do? So, you know, we even use these training environments, you know, for our kids. You know, we're, we're looking at trying to make their, their bedrooms a living laboratory. Uh, and, and we can do that all the way up junior high, high school, college level and professionals, right? Turn your office into a living laboratory. Have a little running control environment sitting on your desk, something so you're immersed. The goal is immersion, right? If you're immersed in it and it's easy to work with, not only are you going to learn, but then you're going to be able to apply it in your career and in your home and, and be able to share with others, you know, what's going on. And and that's what's been exciting. You know, I've, I'm immersed in it, right? It's everywhere. We get these pies all over the place, right? So all of a sudden, you know, you have this $35 computer and then you can take this image you can put it wherever you want. Um, you know, I'm saying the Raspberry Pi image, and you can immerse yourself into the environment. And that's really what IoT is. Now, you, you know, there we get in the Internet of Things and the home automation. I'm nervous, right? I'm nervous from the standpoint of how do you separate and segment, and what are you controlling, and how valuable are those assets, and how do you babysit this equipment that doesn't have a conscience? No different than what we're doing in ICS, right? It's the exact same model. Um, the other big element, as I said, there's a lot of new people on this uh, webinar. Make sure you join the CyBodyWorks community. You know, we're over 200 participants. We actually just leapfrogged from like 150 to 200 in the past two weeks. It's like boom. Uh, and I don't know where it's going to go after this. I'm excited to, to see, you know, how many participants are, are a part of the community. Uh, the big part is, is also to be active in the community. You know, post things. Post things you go and you find and discover and, and that you're involved with. So, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more updates coming from us, from me to the community. That's a 2016 goal, uh, you know, to try to, uh, you know, my, my core goal is every month be able to have a, an online lecture that's going to be posted on there. Uh, my hope is for me to get so excited and everybody else to get so immersed in it that these things are happening even more often than that. But I have to be realistic. And I'm just going to start with once a month and, and then we'll go from there. So some of the new features. You know, the, uh, I, I still remember when um, Windows XP was announced, you know, back in, uh, or Windows 90, 98, actually, even as we get into it, 98 to, to XP. Uh, Melinda Gates told Bill Gates, you know what, what you need to do to sell more of these products is to have wizards for everything, right? And, and that's exactly what I'm trying to get into with cybersecurity. I want wizards. I want, I want it to be easy. For you to get over the hurdle of everything's broken that doesn't have anything to do with your training or what you're trying to learn or what you're trying to demonstrate, and it just works. It's just you know, it's just simple to be able to demonstrate what you want to have, and that's what these mini kits are. So we now have a mini kit 2.0 wizard. Now that only works with our 2.0 editions. Uh, I'll show them. Uh, they require certain GPIO pins for it to be able to work out for the traffic light. But now it's just a one click, and all of a sudden it sets up the full traffic light and HMI, and you're done. Uh, added in Jan, uh, John Seidel's Jan, Jan Seidel's uh, virtual plan that he demonstrated uh, um, just uh, a few months ago. What an awesome tool. I mean, I'm so excited about the software and how we used Python gaming scenarios uh, to be able to build out a, uh, a bottling plant. And, and he has a, a pretty exciting vision, I think, on, on some other things that are going on there and, and trying to develop some of these software-based models, soft models, which, uh, you know, I, I would be I'm super excited if, uh, if I can support him and if we can figure out a way to, to expand the CyBodyWorks platform with more virtual plants. Uh, tying into the Cisco, specifically developing a wizard for the SG200 uh, H series, little mini Cisco switch, so that we can combine with core other physical hardware besides the Raspberry Pi and your virtual machine, the CyBodyWorks virtual machine. So what we can then do is we can take the network interfaces that are on the 200 H series and make them be attached uh, to other physical cyber devices, but you can put them anywhere you want inside the network. So we just make it easy as a wizard. Uh, an ICS protocol generator. I have five protocols in it. I didn't get BACnet completed. I have one night. Hey, I'm going to knock out BACnet in that, uh, uh, hey, life took over that night. So it just didn't work out. Uh, but the, it's, you know, the model's there and it's going to be easy to be able to create protocol after protocol after protocol generator wizards uh, inside of uh, the core platform. We've added in my best TCP support <coughs> for the ESP8266 chip. If you're not familiar with that chip, it's pretty amazing. It's the Raspberry Pi except wireless and then about $2 a chip. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, of, of interesting things around that ESP8266. Uh, you have Espressif that wrote the uh, uh, 
uh, the initial IDE for it, you know, this last summer, uh, I think the the number was they offered forty million dollars if you could find a back door <coughs> in their development suite, their ID, you know, their their development uh, environment that they use as a bug bounty program. I don't think anybody's found it yet, but why it had happened was earlier in the year, <coughs> some people had found that it was calling out by, to a uh, a name surfer out in a uh, foreign country on its own as part of its default configuration. Who knows how it got there, right? I mean, I'm not going to go into any details, but there is some interesting story behind that chip. But when we use the Arduino IDE, it reloads in the firmware every time we, a new firmware, every time it, it loads in, it's, it's running logic. Uh, and we've expanded that to use Modbus TCP in a nice little small platform. And I'll show it to you uh, in a demonstration here. Um, Mini CPS. Mini CPS is a competitor to Core somewhat. Again, open source software defined networking. But what was sort of cool is over in Singapore, they created a, uh, the, uh, the water uh, analysis test bed. Uh, so they have a fully running uh, freshwater wastewater system. Uh, using Ethernet IP, right? And Allen Bradley PCC is a protocol uh, that they uh, that they designed, and it's just a one click, and you get it up and running. Now, Mini CPS is not visual, you know, and it's not the easiest thing to figure out. And again, we're not providing any documentation yet around that. Uh, I'm just starting to learn exactly how it works. The port being, it sets up three different PLCs and an HMI, real quick. Uh, <clears throat> Loopback uh, ICS with quick draw tests. You know, we, we have it so that again on your loopback, we can quickly have the Snort ICS running with quick draw. Again, digital bonds, quick draw images all built into it. Uh, we've updated Catilia. Catilia is the teensy the Wino little um, uh, social engineering platform. We'll show you how that works, but you can set it up. The whole goal is to get somebody to plug in some kind of a USB oriented device on a system so you can exfiltrate out the data. Uh, we've updated the red point in map scripts. That was from, again, Digital Bond. These are all the scripts that are there to be able to query device uh, on the network using the same types of commands that the engineering workstation software would use, uh, which is pretty slick. We've updated OpenVAS. It's not that exciting. We actually don't really recommend using OpenVAS or Nessus or anything else in a control environment because they don't necessarily depict the risk correctly, right? They identify risks that are publicly discussed, but most of the risks of, uh, associated with ICS devices are not publicly discussed, right? They don't get disclosed through U.S. CERT bulletins, so they really are categories of risk that you have to understand. And we've added in a bunch of new white papers. I'm going to do a quick check here. I had a question that came in. Uh, does the mini kit to refer to the version of the Saibati image or a specific configuration of hardware kit or both? So, it refers to both. So Minikit 2.0, uh, number one is the software we're releasing now, and then number two, the I.O. board uh, that we're still prototyping. All right? I'm going to show you what the current one, the current prototype looks like, but I literally have a couple more chips we have to add on the board, and then that's going to get released in January with our first online training. Uh, the, combi the combination of the two uh, will be released together. All right. Uh, the I.O. board. So that's a, that was a good segue. Appreciate that. Um, so we're adding in the I.O. board, number one, an infrared transmitter and receiver. I hope so. All right, we still have, I have the chips. We've got everything here. We're going to figure out how much that's going to impact our supply chain. Uh, but we're going to do that to incorporate uh, wireless crane control. Right? We're, I really want to hammer on the, all these wireless cranes are all over the place and, and putting in intentional security within that model. And so we're going to be putting in those infrared transmitters to support it. We always have in our curriculum and handout to participants a little uh, – uh, you know, the television remote controls that control the TVs. Well, now that's going to be built on the circuit board to be able to support it. Uh, we're putting in a, a H-Bridge motor controller, right, because we want to be able to expand into. I'll show you a, a Fisher Technic assembly line model that we're going to allow the platform to expand into. So we're going to put a, a, a two-motor motor controller directly on the board. Uh, we already have an MPN transistor array to allow other voltages to be controlled using the GPIO pins. Uh, we're going to go to removable screw terminals. So once you build out your model, you can just take the screw terminals off and be able to store it a lot easier. And the Siemens and the Rockwell are gradable. That's what we were talking about, I was talking about earlier. It lays little printed circuit boards that will have these fingers that will just go directly into the controllers to take our same trainer unit to expand into those. And then the assembly line expansion, I'll show that in a moment. Raspberry Pi, we've added in a wizard where now we're supporting wireless since we're going to do the ASP8266, as well as incorporating our new uh, Android uh, Mobus TCP phone sensor uh, software. That's all openly available. It's in the Raspberry Pi image through the web server. Since we're doing that, we have to make sure that we have wireless uh, built into the Raspberry Pi by default. Uh, so 
to support that, you then would need to go buy. We supported the LG uh, Optimus uh, Express uh, phone, little $20 um, pay-as-you-go plan. You go buy that off Amazon. I think it's down to 15 now. And then we expose the phone's sensors uh, via Modbus TCP as an RTU into the environment. So now you can use X, Y, and Z accelerometers, uh, access accelerometers, the magnetometer that's there, the light sensor. Well, actually, that one doesn't have a light sensor, but the, uh, the face detect sensor, all the sensors that are built in the foam, you can then have that be exposed in the environment. And we were excited to work with uh, um, Pratik uh, over at um, um, Hubble Education to be able to get us that, that, uh, that APK Android app built out. Uh, so we recommend you buying, again, and dedicating a phone to go and support that. And then what the wizard does, it allows you to create a hotspot on the fly. Uh, we've also included the Tesla Demo HMI Android APK. Again, that's written by Tesla uh, directly. We just have that as a download so you can start building out. It has a 60-day trial license built into it. Uh, I had said we added in Lightshow Pi uh, with the FM and radio data stream transmission all disabled, but it is there, an easy thing to turn on. But make sure that you go and review part 15 of the FCC code before you go and do it. I've done personal testing as a hobbyist to be able to see how it works and what the transmission ranges are. Uh, it is interesting, you know, the fact that you can transmit not only by FM, but also multiple frequency ranges out of the device just through a GPIO pin. Uh, you know, as a cybersecurity professional, that's a pretty interesting way of doing data exfiltration. Uh, but point being, we added in Lightshow Pi just as a, a fun little uh, holiday edition, and we'll show that in our demonstration. Uh, a couple other white papers that we put into the distro. One was Lou Folker's ICS Forensics. He went and got his uh, forensic certification with the SAN Institute, and we sent him our industrial additional training kit for him to be able to build that paper off of. So that was released in September. We've added that into there, as well as Marina Crotophil over at uh, Zero Nights just uh, about a few weeks ago <clears throat> gave a presentation on the mini kit Assessment. So her and a couple other colleagues went through and did a, a pretty substantial assessment and then presented that at a conference. And we've included that PDF uh, within the, uh, uh, the distribution as well. And another question, and then we're going to get into our demonstration. All right. So where can we, when and where can we purchase the new kit? It's going to be part of the training. So as it is right now, I'm only going to be selling it as part of the training. We got to recapture some of our... Uh, our, my time and investment into into everything, and plus to be able to, to get the best out of it. You know, so if you sign up for the training on the Saibati site, that's going to be the way to manage it. Now, if you already have a kit or have already gone through the training, so take that back. If you've already gone through the training, then you can just buy an upgrade and just contact me offline. We haven't had a lot of people that have gone through the training. We did one a year ago. I just did a, a few people. Uh, as part of our alpha, really, we're still in the middle of that education on the kits, and then it's going to be part of our training, and the goals get shipped out to you. Um, so let me do a demonstration here. I have the uh, the kit up and, and running. Now, I want to show my camera here as well. So here's the, the new training kit. Now, I have this, I do have the pie in a different case than what it comes with because I'm actually stacking a couple pies here in my design just to show some of the expansions that you can do with the kit. So the kit itself comes with one Raspberry Pi and a case to go along with it, but of course you can expand out as add as many as you want. It comes with the new wireless transmitter, it comes with an Ethernet adapter, Ethernet cable. You know, here I'm showing the adapter. Uh, here is the ESP8266 chip. I got a little traffic light going on it. We also have our traffic lights in the intersection that are all working. Uh, this is the Cisco switch that I can expand into. And also just to show you some of the history of our training boards, right? This is, you know, if I take the current board used in SANS ICS 515, they don't have the external screw terminals. They stop us with this design. We then started expanding out to expose the UARTs as well as the I2C bus and it'll allow us to have access to some of the voltage and grounding on the Raspberry Pi. Next version of the boards. We went ahead and expanded out some of the GPIOs, right, as well as allowed access to voltages on the left-hand side. Uh, so allow for screw terminals. So the next version, now we're still allowing that access, but we're going through an MPN transistor array. Uh, and the one we're working on now adds in an H bridge. We're going to put a transistor array on the other side, and then all these screw terminals, they'll be 15 pins wide. We're going to be able to just lift those up and take them off so you can make for easy storage for whatever you expand into as a design. 
Uh, the expansions right here. I'll, I'll just show an expansion before we get into the demonstrations since I'm just going through this. Here's an example exp assembly, assembly line expansion where now it's using Fisher Technic and basically it has these individual photo sensors on each side moving the product back and forth, but it still uses the Raspberry Pi and it still uses now the traffic light really as an assembly line indicator of the current process of that assembly line. So let me. Uh, you can sign up for the training now. It's available on the website. Is there an academic deployment support for university? Talk to me offline about universities on, uh, on what I can do there to, uh, to support you. Um, so let me just show the first wizard here. The first wizard is the mini kit wizard. I can just double click on this. It does a check to make certain that the USB Ethernet adapter is associated with a virtual machine. Now that's what I'm showing in the upper left hand corner here. I do have two different adapters associated. The one here that's the King King is actually the USB um, transmit and receive UART cable to be able to configure the ESP8266 uh, chip. And then the A6 is the Sabrent Ethernet adapter that has a two port USB hub. Again, that all comes inside the mini kit. So it does a check to make sure it's connected. If it wasn't, then it would error out right here. Uh, it then does a check to make certain it can talk to the Raspberry Pi. Now the Raspberry Pi image is set up with an IP address by default. And what this does is actually give an IP, the wizard also gives an IP address to the CyBodyWorks virtual machine. By default, the virtual machine doesn't have an IP address. And in fact, that's true for most of the services on the devices. Everything is turned off by default. Whenever you boot them up, you have to go and enable them. Uh, we have the option here of picking the USA traffic ladder, the European version. We'll just say USA. And then we have the option now of what HMI you'd like to use. Now, the difference between these, peak HMI versus ignition. Peak HMI is really a, a full built, you know, um, it's a Windows application running in Wine. It does OPC as well as a other variety set of industrial protocols. It is a trial license. The license has 20 minutes of runtime use, two hours of development use. And then after that, it'll crash out or just stop. It doesn't crash out. It stops, and you just have to shut it off and start it up again, and you get that same type of license. The ignition service is two hours of runtime, and again, you just have to reset the trial edition. You're up and running again. But it does OPC UA, again, the uh, uh, the new edition of OPC, newer edition. So I'm going to pay PKHMI, and then you just click OK, and then it just sets everything up. Right? You don't have to do anything else. It's going to go off the Raspberry Pi, reset the Rex Core daemon that's running out there. We use Rex Control software. Software. That's what we work with out of the Czech Republic to be able to get Modbus as a protocol running on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, further, with that, we use function block diagrams to be able to put the logic on. So this wizard goes ahead and then launches Rextraw once we've reset all the services that are there, finds the running logic that we need to run on it, pushes it out to the device. Uh, automatically does downloads that it's running in demo mode. That's true because it is another demonstration license with a two hour runtime. Uh, you can go and upgrade it, right? That's all upgradable. Uh, you know, to go to Rex Controls and do an upgrade on it. And then it launches the HMI. Now my traffic light will be up and running and we're running Modbus as a protocol between the two different uh, devices now, right? And that's it. Now, just to show as a demonstration of another wizard, uh, the question is, do the new wizards support the SNES? They only support uh, the new version, the mob, the uh, mini kit 2.0. Now, if you want to expand it into the snap circuits, uh, you then use the expandable GPIO pins uh, on the left-hand side of the I.O. board, and you can expand it right back out to the, uh, the current snap circuit design. Uh, now, another wizard we have, if you go to the shortcuts folder, you can go on the CyBodyWorks wizards and then mini kit. And here's one that allows for uh, HTML control using PHP Modbus. Uh, another one here that uh, uh, takes the traffic light and the CyBodyWorks VM and then places it into the Naval Research Laboratory core software and then does a Modbus man the middle attack using EdderCap. So we'll do this one, just double click on it. It says here traffic light and HMI should be operational. If these are not currently running, please run the CyBodyWorks menu could initial setup wizard. Do you wish to continue? Yes, now it's going to go and start up this infrastructure. So again, what core is, is it's literally going to build out this network for me. And it's going to have the operator here, my PLC here, and then we have our HMI over here, and we have a router, and then we have this guy that's going to do the attack between these two different points. So it's going to start them all up. We're going to, it sets the host virtual machine into this zone. 
Uh, by default, the core software doesn't allow the host VM, the Sabati Works VM, to talk into this environment, and there's some tricks you have to play to be able to get that to work. Uh, I do all those tricks in these hooks right here. There's some scripts you can do as NRL core hooks. Click OK. And then click OK to launch the manual HMI all on Editor Cap Attack. Now, if you're an operator out there, you know, you get this pop up, I would hope you wouldn't click OK to this. Uh, I'm saying that as a joke. But go back to my runtime, we can see here. And in fact, if I just want to take a look <coughs> at the traffic that's going on, we can go to the uh, uh, local network. Let's see, how do I want to do this? Uh, we'll do it from the threat. So we'll do a Wireshark dump. And right now we don't see any traffic except for, un, uh, for broadcasts and for uh, uh, unknown right, TCP right, as we get into, you know, we're, we're only, since it's a switch, we're not gonna see any uh, unicasts. We're only gonna see unknown unicasts or broadcasts or multicasts. In this case, we're seeing multicast traffic because OSPF is flying across here. But if I go and say continue with this wizard, launch the attack, we can then see that it, uh, you know, this guy just did it. It did an attack. It did its ARP first because it wanted to go after the device, and then it it wanted to go in the middle of the transmission, and now it is actually in the middle of the transmission. It just did an ARP spoof between the two different nodes uh, that this traffic was in between. And if I go back to my HMI, all right, the the operator's blinded now. So, you know, we make it really easy for you to be able to show, you know, all the reasons why you want to have uh, switches, not hubs. All the reason in your ICS environment. All the reasons why you want to have ports disabled by default. All the reasons why you want to have uh, BPDU guard and, and MAC address filtering and, and, you know, port security. All those elements that are staples at really layer two of the OSI model of security controls, it's really easy to then see it and be able to demonstrate it. So we can then go ahead and stop the attack, you know, and, and then move on. Now, you know, the, the attack that I just demonstrated here, this is still the same one uh, that, uh, you know, we, we developed uh, different attacks against Modbus and DMP3 and Allen Bradley PCC for the industrial edition. And, uh, you know, I tested it over to, uh, uh, James Solderich and Villanova University and the, the students there that they, they then ported that over and shared it back to the community. Uh, they ported it over the mini kit and shared it back to the community. And so now we were able to include it. And we, you know, there's a, a contrib folder that's in the labs directory that it's, you know, it says Villanova University and that's the one we, we script off. Be able to do that in admin help. So let me close this out. And there's a lot more you can explore in here, but I want to make sure this is an effort of time that I get through all the elements I want to show. I have to stop the uh, core from running. You know, as we go through, it starts it up. It went from a black to a green to, to nothing around the boxes as I was starting. Now it's going from a red, and then it'll go to a black, and then it will uh, then blank out, showing that it's stopped the, the uh, uh, core software. If I were to do an if config right now, you can see all the virtual interfaces within the, the host. Uh, virtual machine, these VEs that were set up, as well as the virtual bridges uh, that were put in place to be able to support it. And now, if I do that if config one more time, since it stopped it, you can see we're just back to ETH0, which is provided by the USB Ethernet adapter uh, that we have connected in. So let me close that guy out, and let me show you another wizard we have in here. So another one really easy to work with. Uh, is the community virtual plant. So again, Jan Seidel, I mean, my gosh, what an awesome tool. And when I saw this, I'm like, oh, we got to script that into the platform and get it to work with core. So you just come in, click on the uh, virtual plant wizards. It takes us straight into the shortcuts location. And we built a little training um, scenario. So you can just open up the scenario. It's going to step you through here. You know, it, you go through step one and around the horn here, and, and you're able to then, you know, do a little attack and then launch Wireshark and make sure you enable port mirroring and then launch Wireshark again and do the attack. And we even have Snort with Quick Draw Wizards already set up uh, with Quick Draw set up so you can generate alerts uh, that are there. We have it do a host based firewall. And again, you know, absolutely, this is only part of the solution. There's plenty of other things that are out there that you need to put in place as security controls, not just technically, but a lot of them procedurally. 
There's a lot of procedural security that has to happen for good ICS cybersecurity, not just technology. And that's where I'm hoping that you can use this as the educational element. You know, some, sure, there's going to be people rejecting, well, how did the threat get there in the first place? What was the connection? I'm like, well, you know what? Sadly, the engineers were the pivot, you know, over at Natanz and that Iranian facility, they were the pivot. And, and we're, you know, the, the technicians, the network security engineers, the IT administrators, we're all great pivots. We have the tools and the keys to the kingdom. Software developers, you are an excellent pivot. They can be manipulated IDE development environments. I mean, that's that's a great attack vector that an attacker wants to take advantage of. So the tool here, first one, just start Virtua Plan. And it puts it inside a core and it builds out the whole environment, right? So I, I gave multiple network and nodes here as part of the design. So I had routing protocols, so you can add in other elements. And it started up this whole bottling process. So again, we you know, we expanded this, but uh, Jan Cito is who developed this to begin with, and then we incorporated it into core. So you can just go and click run, you know. And now this is our HMI on the right hand side, and left hand side is our running process. And it's going to sit here and, and and go through its process. Now, again, you know, we can as this starts filling up, you know, and and running every time it hits the green element, it starts filling. When it hits red, it stops filling the individual bottles. Well, we, we can bring up a console on each one of these nodes. Here I was, I just brought up the console on the engineering workstation. If I want to go to the router and bring up its console. I can just bring up the VTY, or I even go into config mode. Uh, you know, use the, uh, the question mark as my friend to configure individual routers. All of that's accessible. We can right click on here and do a Wireshark dump, right, as I did earlier, which I need to close out. Um, actually, I did close it out. Okay. So we're filling this up. And let's see, we'll bring this back to how it was. And then we get to the next part of the process here, the wizard. It says to, you know, review the engineering schematics. So again, Jan did this. He had a, a, a nice PDF that goes to the process that he implemented for a bottle filling application and how it works. And again, fantastic. All right, great. He even shows the ladder logic to go along with it. We can then execute our logic attacks. And what do we want to do? Do we want to move and fill? Do we want to do never stop? Do we want to stop the whole process? Do we want to do stop and fill? And you can just do move and fill, and you can then go back here and see it's no longer going to stop at the right point, and it's going to also fill beyond the point and start creating you know, a little bit of a disaster in the process. Now, if you want to stop each one of these attacks, you just launch it again, hit cancel, and then that'll stop the attack and go back to working correctly. Just a moment, so I just stopped there, and now it's going to start filling up things uh, correctly. So, you know, now as it's running, you know, we can go and launch and review Wireshark, and we can see Wireshark's not really seeing too much right now as we have our tap point in the environment. Well, you know, that's because we actually, you know, I just saw a broadcast or excuse me, a multicast from OSPF, but we're not seeing anything else. Well, that's because we actually have to enable port mirroring. And so what this does is it goes on the switch that we're connected to and sets an aging time of zero, basically turning it into a hub. Now, that's not really how port mirroring works. You know, port mirroring works differently within the switch fabric of the Cisco switch. But the point being, now that we've done that, we just took that node and set the aging time so that the switch acts like a hub. We can now go back and launch Wireshark again and actually see you know, the Modbus traffic going back and forth, right? And again, we're launching Wireshark on this V32 interface, which is on a uh, on this uh, Bodyworks uh, virtual machine that we're connected to. So now that's running. We can come back, right, and, and do the attack again, be able to capture, you know, some of that traffic, the fact that some other actor is talking that, uh, that was different. So you can start reviewing that. Uh, to see how it's changed. But again, it's pretty, pretty hard, right? You have to manually go through the process to be able to see all that. So, you know, we can come back. Let me show you here again what's happening. The attack is occurring. It's filling all those up. Uh, and we can then cancel it again. And as that's happening, now it's going to work correctly. And we can go back to our wizard. And we can launch Snort. Maybe that'll help us see alerts a little bit better and what's going on. So let's go ahead and uh, and do this attack one more time and see what's actually occurring in the environment. And look at that. You can see all these unauthorized write core quests. Now that's only because 
in the historic comp configuration file that we have set up, we only allow Modbus traffic to go up between two different nodes, and this attack is coming from a different node than was it, that was actually approved in this case. So it was very, very easy uh, to be able to see. Uh, come back, and we'll cancel that attack again. Now, of course, that's just telling us things are bad, right? An IDS doesn't stop anything. What we'd like to be able to do is actually prevent it. And that's where we can just go ahead and say, we'll just enable this firewall ruling to the, the, the actual process. And it does it on the logic controller, the soft logic controller, node 11, that's running it. And now if we try to do that attack again, it fails. Right? We, we get an alert. I, and what we actually see here is I set up IP tables to generate ICMP port on reachables so that we can at least see the traffic showing up uh, within the uh, IDS uh, in this case. And then we just get into uh, stop virtue plan and it just shuts everything down for us and we're good to go. Uh, and then of course, you know, sign up for a course. <laughs> uh, now the next part uh, that we have in here is the uh, protocol generator. <clears throat> so, got a bunch of wizards in here. You can just pick which one you want to run and it'll generate those protocols. So I'll go to the first one here. And uh, actually we'll go, we'll, we'll jump to one. We'll go to Mopbus. And it just starts up again the core software. And what I did is I scripted out, we built out uh, using Python Mobbus all the different ways, uh, a lot of the, not all the different ways, but several different ways that, that Mobbus can communicate between a client and a server. And it says, you know, right click on node one, select Wireshark E0, and we have to wait a while for everything to start communicating. And part of that is waiting for OSPF to synchronize between these two routers. Uh, we have to wait for, uh, <clears throat> that's, the that's the primary thing, waiting for us to speak guys between the two routers so we can get it to work. I want the environment to, to have a lot of flexibility on how you'd like to look at these protocols. And the Cybotyworks platform, again, this host prompt, I can go in here and, and you're, you're inside this network, right? I can go and ping 10.0.0.1. I mean, I'm, I'm here. I can ping all these clients that are set up uh, in each one of these. But if I were to go and right click, go Wireshark, hit uh, you know, E zero. At first, we're going to see a lot of, of failed. Um, well, no, we won't because I changed it. I, I set all of the, uh, uh, the services to wait 60 seconds before they start. But we can see here uh, some traffic already happening. And some of them is Modbus over UDP, which uh, the dissector for Wireshark does not understand by default. We can see there's some read input registers, clear counters, clear counters and diagnostic requests, return bus communication error, return slave message, return slave NAC, diagnostics settings, right? So we have, it'll go through and continue to, to just try change ASCII delimiter force list and only mode. It's just going to try all these different types of Modbus communications and, and keep cycling through them, you know, over and over and over so you can get a capture. And, and then you can start playing with those protocols and see how they actually work um, or how you may be able to manipulate them or how you want to go and protect them or dump them even through an IPsec tunnel in the middle here. Whatever you want to do, there's just a lot of flexibility on how you'd like to implement it. So a question just came in, everything that I'm showing right now, is it independent of the kit hardware? Yes, the software is going out to the community. Everything I'm showing you is getting released this afternoon as oh, it should be being uploaded and you get this. So what I'm showing you right now uh, doesn't have anything to do with the kit hardware. Hit stop, now it goes and collapses, right, that whole environment and we're ready to do the next uh, test. So let's go and look at DMP3. So we compiled in uh, open DMP3 from Adam Crane and uh, we used his test scenarios that were built into it originally about a year ago. He's removed those from the current distribution. But uh, we can then come in here, do Wireshark E0, and you know we have to wait for OSPF again to synchronize up uh, or else we're gonna get port unreachables going back and forth as we're trying to make those connections here again on TCD port uh, 20,000. Um, so the question is, the traffic generator by MGen and NRL Core? No, it's not. Uh, <clears throat> everything we're generating is using real clients and real servers, right? So in this case, it's an open DMP3 client uh, and a uh, server that's set up on the uh, 
on the other side using OpenDMP3. And the way we're doing this uh, is literally, oh, well, let, let me wait and do this capture and then I'll show it to you. So now we have some DMP3 traffic going back and forth. And let me stop this and I'll show you how we're doing it. Stop. So if I go to configure mode for this server and go to services, there's a user to find option. And I am actually starting up this little shell script that launches that server running on that system. Now we do have four different types of protocol generators built into this platform. We will start using those. Uh, MGen, of course, is there. Uh, iPerf is there. Ostinato uh, is built into this. And then there's one more. If I go to, let me see if I can try to remember it. Uh, cancel out of that. Shortcuts. Most of these are in my test environment. So ITG. ITG is the other generator that's built into it. And you can see some other things we're testing out that are in here. We already have Compot built in. Uh, Diania is in here. Uh, you know, CyberLens uh, is built into this as well from Draco Security to be able to do visualization. We're going to build a scenario around that. Uh, Wemo is already built into this. Uh, there's the FM testing that I was talking about before. We can actually make GPIO pin number four turn into an FM transmitter. Uh, BACnet I'm working on, as you can see. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of elements that are in here uh, that you can test out. I'll show you one more wizard. This is actually based upon the Brazilian RMPSR, uh, an educational institution down in Brazil. And I just really like it. They had they built a laboratory environment around routing protocol. So you can come in here if you want to learn more about the RIP protocol. It just starts up core automatically and then launches the PDF file uh, after it's launched up. Uh, to be able to step you through the lab. And, and we're going to, you know, this is an example of what I'm moving towards uh, for the integrated labs that we're going to have within the platform and what we're going to be using uh, in our courseware, just to give you a demonstration, uh, is doing things like that. Um, all right. Uh, the other part, I talked about the search engine. Uh, the search engine that's in here is pretty amazing, right? If you just want to look at... Uh, Arena's presentation, you know, it's it's already in here. And again, they did a full analysis of the uh, the mini kit platform that I, you know, she came out to DEF CON and looked at what we were working on there. And of course, had the traffic light up and running and did quite a bit of, of review of, of what was happening uh, in the environment and the types of ways that they could manipulate the traffic light. It wasn't everything. Uh, there were several other ways that you could go in and make some changes, but it's a it's a good presentation. And of course, if you get the traffic light platform, it, it's you know we use this in our course to be able to go and discuss what's going on. If you look at uh, Lou's presentation, uh, really the fifth one, the world and doing forensics and ICS environments. Again, a really good document using our industrial edition, and he talks about being able to review. Again, the Saibati Industrial Kit, where we have the Mycologics 1400, the Siemens controller, the network switch, and then what he did to do uh, ICS forensics, uh, basically, on those devices. So that's another really good presentation uh, to go along with it. Um, starting to run out of time. I don't know if there is any questions. Let's see. I'm just going to do a, a quick look here to see what else I want to make. Oh, the in-map red point scripts, as I said, we've expanded those to include some of the other elements that were available now, ATG info. Uh, is now easy to use. Amron UDP is another one we added in. And again, what these do is they they simulate the engineering workstation software and how it dynamically queries in the network what kind of devices are there. Um, and then it feeds that into InMap. Now, don't you know? Really urge you to make certain that you understand and do a lot of testing before you run anything like this in a production facility. Uh, you know, this traffic and the way it can be used can very easily bring something down uh, very successfully. You know, the, the, and it's all because the design of our control systems is built, even though Ethernet uh, is not really a predictable uh, communication protocol, right? You can have variable length sizes of frames, that's variable lengths of delay that then comes with that. So it's interesting uh, that we've moved to that. But point being is that it's predictable because you know about how much Ethernet traffic you should be having on that control network and in what way it's talking. So when you introduce some additional type of traffic, it can impact the scan rates and how the process is actually designed for. But uh, that's automatically built in here. Um, I said I'd updated Cotillia. You know, Cotillia, you know, we, in our new mini kits, we also include the TNC Duino. 
and the ability with the Arduino IDE to be able to create these payloads very easily. All right, so you want to create a payload, you want to gather data, I want to dump the wireless LAN keys, and then once you dump the wireless LAN keys, I want to dump those out and exfil them out to uh, uh, by DNS text queries or via pastebin. All that's built into you know, this script generator that then builds the Arduino code that you load on the Teensy Duino, and then your attack is to trick somebody to plug in the USB device or to ship in a USB-based keyboard as a trial effort or whatever it is. It's, a, it's absolutely a physical cyber attack uh, with a gateway thinking that you're going to be able to communicate outbound. Now, it doesn't have to communicate that way. You can actually strap a little 400 megahertz transmitter or other types of transmitters directly on this little piece of hardware to transmit that data out wirelessly uh, as well. So... Uh, that's in here just to be able to demonstrate and show, you know, how could that virtual plant attack actually occur? Uh, how could you get into a facility? Some of the fundamentals you can look through here. We've added in a bunch of flashcards. You know, so if you're interested in, in testing yourselves and different types of terminology uh, from the NIST 853 or 882, that's all built into here. So, again, we're trying to build a fully, you know, fully sweet training platform. Uh, we updated Rextraw the 2.7. Uh, that makes Rextraw support S7 as a protocol as well. Uh, in the protocol generator, we do have the Snap7 library. I do not have these two things working with each other. It absolutely could happen, uh, but we don't have that configured yet. All right, so let me uh, go back and talk about community involvement. Uh, number one, community postings, right? We're pushing out this soft virtual machine for really, you know, free of use without having to have the full mini kit to go along with it. Uh, with the hope uh, that you'll give postings maybe on the current protocol generators, virtual plan, however you're using it uh, in, in any way that you can. That reminds me one more element I wanted to show as a wizard. If you go to the core, this is where you set up the Cisco Systems 208. Uh, it already has the configuration file that you need to load in to be able to do all the VLANs. And then you can launch core and basically have each one of the physical interfaces on that SG200 be in different subnets. So this is physical interface 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And what this, this wizard just did is it actually took my Ethernet interface and turned it into a VLAN trunk. And what the uh, previous wizard does is does a configuration on the Cisco switch to enable port uh, zero to be a VLAN trunk interface so we can have multiple subnets that we're talking around on. So it allows us to combine core with other cyber physical systems. And this is what we're going to do to expand into our industrial edition. We're going to allow the MicroLogics or the uh, uh, different types of controllers to be able to connect into these physical interfaces all using the core software. So I forgot to show that. So maybe you'd end up using that, right? Maybe you go, because we're not going to sell that as part of our kits. It doesn't make any sense. You can go to Amazon, buy one of these things for 70 bucks, 60 bucks. And next thing you know, I'm not going to be able to compete. you holding it in the lab and just touching it. I'm going to have to raise the price. So you just go and buy it, expand your kit. Next thing you know, you're doing cyber physical assessments and including some other type of devices you want to have in your own environment. But we're going to build out some other wizards, as my, was going to be my point, where what if you had, you know, your own firewall, but you want to be able to take this protocol generator wizard and push it through your firewall to make certain certain commands are only getting through? You want to test it. Well, we can then build, we could build a core environment that has two different Ethernet interfaces, physical Ethernet interfaces, and you connect them to your firewall that you want to go and test. Or you want to test an IDS. You want to, you know, all of those things we can do uh, pretty easily. Um, you know, and maybe those are things you want to try to extend and share back. Or if you have specific requests, let me know and we can build those in. We want to add in some new protocol generators. Uh, universal plug and play. It's a big one we want to talk about in the IoT community. Wemo as well in the IoT community. We want to be able to add in some of those protocol generators and then show some of the attack surface that are with the protocols and the defensive measures you want to put in place. And anything else you may want to do in the environment. Uh, the DUI, DIY elements. So our new online course available. You can go to the website to be able to sign up for it. It includes the course books, uh, online access to pre-recorded lectures, uh, hands-on labs, six office hour sessions across that six-week period, and the mini kit that, uh, that I was just discussing. Uh, let me wrap up here with, uh, I'm going to do one more demonstration just of the light show pie, and, uh, and then uh, I'll see what questions came in. So let me... Go to my shortcuts, Pi, and I'm going to stop Rexcore.
Some of these scripts I need to clean up. We need to clean up a little bit so they give you a little bit more feedback. Uh, we're basically using P-Link and SSHing into the device and stopping the service um, as it is right now. And sure, right, I mean, this is truly a test environment. All these passwords are well known. Uh, what we're using. So you, you want to be, you, know, you don't want to necessarily connect this up directly to the internet. You know, that's why I want it all private using using our own USB Ethernet adapter. So I'll go do this light show pie. And um, I'll, just take, I'll show you here what happens. Now, for this to work, we actually use the speakers in a virtual machine that you have, your host OS, the virtual machine has a sound card. And we take the audio and we pump it across using a Pulse Audio network adapter. Uh, so that you don't have to plug in a speaker into the Raspberry Pi. It's just going to use your speakers and your host OS. Okay. Let me see if any other questions came in. Mini kit is the takeaway of the student of the line. Absolutely. You take the clash, you get the mini kit, it's yours to keep. Uh, normal update mechanism of Spyworks image, as it is right now, it's always a brand new download. You know, our last one happened in July. Uh, it's probably going to be, uh, I'm going to guess, we're trying to do about every three month interval. You know, the last one we did on the community was in July. Uh, we did do an update for the Sand Institute three months ago, so it really depends. Uh, the industrial edition, absolutely. That's our full. That's that is an in-person course for the industrial edition. Uh, we team two people together uh, for a pod. You get the ten thousand dollar mini kit, uh, mini kit, full kit. You don't get to keep that. We bring that back at the end of it. Uh, but you know, that's right now. We only offer that about every uh, for public enrollment three times a year through the San Institute. We do a lot of private training. We come come on site to facilities to be able to do that training. Um, is ladder logic program available in the new release? Sort of, right? So uh, the Peak HMI software has a ladder, ladder logic emulator. And I know the person asked that question and brought that up even months ago that it was there. We're still having problems having that be really a good, easy, repeatable process. It crashes out a lot. Uh, I am very intent in getting that to work. So I'm working with uh, the PHMI developer to try to be able to get that to work out and not crash out. Uh, what's nice about it is, of course, as you know, you build the logic and then it emulates, uh, well, it doesn't mean the logic runs and it runs and opens up my Modbus uh, TCP 502 port. Uh, you need to be able to interact with it. And we do already, I do have a little lab that uses it, uh, but it seems to crash out if you manipulate it. So if I go to fundamentals, and circuitry and go to the ladder logic emulator editor. It is here. And right, this trial edition, and I can just go ahead, it automatically launches with the ladder logic, some real simple logic. And we can go to uh, uh, relay ladder logic and it brings it up and it shows the individual registers. And this is a sealed in rung that it goes ahead and designs. And as this is running, I actually now have a service listing on port 502. So you can interact with that service and make these go true or false. Uh, so we could pretty easily add a script in to be able to play with it. The problem is, is once you begin editing, we've had, it's very unpredictable <laughs> how it uh, seems to crash out. But if you just automatically build your ladder logic and discuss it and don't have the participants develop it, it works very well. Um, so that, if I close this guy down. Let's see, 502 just went away. Now the question, IoT protocol fuzzing in the roadmap. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so the Wemo, uh, universal plug and play, big, you know, two big ones. We get into the wireless one, it's gonna be a little bit harder to emulate, uh, but uh, possibly, you know, we'll see where we're gonna go with that. Uh, smart grid simulation planned. Do it, you know, hey, provide back to the community. You know, we have 61850. Um, in there again as a as a generator, so that's where we've started so far. You know the the biggest thing is if you can find, I uh, we need an open library, and if you can give me an open library or some location, we can build it in. Uh, you know each one of these wizards they don't take too long like, for me to be able to go and develop them or us to be able to develop them. It's just a couple hours. It depends. The backnet ones have we're having some challenges because a lot of the openly available tools 
they're they just don't work so great. <laughs> So it, it all depends on the protocols. DMP3 took a while just to get everything to compile correctly. Uh, but it all depends, right? If there's specific requests and protocols you'd like to have, that's the best thing you do. Send me a, send a note to the community, all right? So join the community and post out there, and that's, that's going to be the best process to be able to figure out what gets added in the next edition. All right. If there's no other questions, I'm basically wrapping this up, and – going to go start the upload uh, off the community so you guys can have it. New wizards and attack wizards. There's not a lot of documentation. There needs to be. I, I will take that on to do a presentation in the community so that you can know how to do it. Uh, possibly re helping you reverse engineer the wizard that we have now so you can know how those are done. So good request. Ask the questions of the community. That'll be the best thing to get things started. All right. Thanks, guys. Gals.